Hello, you geeks and nerds. You are listening to the part two of chapter one of my doctoral thesis, Sex and Gender as Sources of Heterogeneity in British Political Attitudes and Behaviors. Doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, but that's generally how um, theses and other academic works uh, end up working. And right now, if we've gone over the introduction and the first part of chapter one. In this bit, I am going to pick up where I left off in the previous video, and I'm going to be reviewing the history of the gender gap and American gender gap theories. Uh, as I've said in other videos, I'm doing these in one take, so if I mess up when I read or I stutter over my words or I can't scroll down in time and I end up pausing or if I lose my place in the, in the paragraph, it's all just going to go in the video. So I'm going to have a quick little drink of water, and then we'll be off. Early studies of American and British political behavior did not view sex or gender as important factors. When sex differences were mentioned, women were portrayed as lacking interest and or having little sense of personal political efficacy. If women did participate, it was assumed they were likely to behave in a manner similar to their husbands, to personalize politics while men focused on more substantive issues, or as Lane described it, it was taken for granted that women's focus was upon personal and peripheral reform issues. In Britain, Butler and Stokes barely mentioned sex in their book Political Change in Britain. There are no direct references to women in the tables or index. index in their analysis, they assigned women to their husband's occupational class, even if those women were in paid work themselves. Overlooking sex as a variable of interest in political behavior continued into the 1980s, even as traditional assumptions about the strength of class as an explanatory variable for partisan identification were being undermined. Franklin's decline in class voting in Britain also makes no reference to sex or to women and assigned a woman's class location according to her husband's occupation. This oversight began to be addressed in the mid-1980s, especially thanks to the work of Norris, inter alia Norris 1985, 1986, and 1988, discussed in greater detail below. Another example is found in Dunleavy and Husband's work who incorporated notions of sex differences into their analysis of voting. The inclusion of the sex variable showed that there was considerable variation in the voting patterns of women in the manual class as compared with the non-manual class. In the United States, the discovery of a sex difference in vote choice came about in the wake of the presidential election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. According to Bonk, the New York Times released the results of presidential voting distribution in the form of a cross-tabulation by sex. The results showed that 54% of men supported Reagan, compared with 46% of women who voted for Reagan. National Organization of Women President Eleanor Smeal brought attention to the 8-point percentage gap between men and women's voting for the Republican candidate. This was the first time a sex-based gap was noticed in American voting behavior, and the term used to describe this sex-based gap, the so-called gender gap, was coined in 1981. Following this discovery of a gender gap in vote choice, political scientists began to analyze data and speculate as to the possible causes of and explanations for the sex gap in partisan identification and vote choice. Subsequent investigations by political scientists revealed that the gender gap in vote choice had actually started as early as 1968. Subsequent to its initial discovery in American vote choice behavior, sex-based differences have been found in issue positions and policy preferences presidential approval ratings, and economic perceptions. Further, there has been a statistically significant gender gap in every presidential election since 1980. How are gender gaps produced? Before reviewing the theoretical accounts of the American gender gap, it is useful to understand the ways in which a gender gap in political issues or preferences or vote choice can be produced. Kaufman and Petrosik defined an attitude difference in political issues. This this attitude difference is dependent upon two factors. One, that men and women have different attitudes on a particular issue, and two, both men and women give the issues approximately equal importance in their political consideration. A simplistic example of this would be attitudes toward military actions. In the Cold War era, public opinion polls showed women suspected that Ronald Reagan might lead the nation into war. If men and women had one statistically significant different 
opinions on Reagan, and two, if both sexes gave equal weight to and voted based upon that perception of Reagan, then an attitudinal gender gap in voting would result. In contrast, the salience hypothesis states that gender differences arise not only from differences in attitude, but also differences in the weight or importance an issue has for the individual. An illustration uh, would be the salience of economic issues, which have been found to be of greater salience to men than to women when making political decisions. Both men and women may wish to see taxes decreased, but it is possible that the importance given to economic policies may weigh more heavily as a factor with men than women when deciding for whom to vote. Knowing how gender gaps can be produced, I review the four main theoretical accounts of the gender gap used in the United States and the major empirical studies of the vote choice, partisan, partisan identifications, and issue preferences of men and women. The causal sources of differences in men and women's political attitudes and behaviors in the United States has been the subject of much speculation. The American studies reviewed below all use secondary analysis, often with American national election study data, and tend to end with similar conclusions. The gender gap is a result of a complex set of interactions between social, economic, and sociological factors. Pause for water break. Howell and Day, for example, conclude that the source of the gender gap differs from issue to issue, at times produced by an explanatory variable having a liberalizing effect on women, at other times produced by having a variable of having a conservative effect on men, all in addition to the contribution of simple economic value and social world differences between males and females. Thus, there are many paths to the gender gap on political issues that lie behind the well-publicized gender gap in partisanship and voting behavior. Most studies of the gender gap in the United States tend to organize gender gap theory into the following categories. 1a. The growing legal autonomy of women related to marital patterns and divorce ratings, and or 1b. Women's increased participation in the workforce, especially public sector employment and dependency on the welfare state. 2. The role of feminism and specifically second wave feminism, and 3. The effects of gendered socialization of men and women. As points 1a and 1b are both related to an increase in women's autonomy, social, including legal and economic autonomy, have a concomitant increase due to interac the interactions of one upon the other, the theoretical review below conflates the last two points into one theoretical framework of women's growing autonomy. It should be noted that in contrast to theories offered above, many authors have provided evidence that it was men's and not women's changing political attitudes and behaviors which led to the gender gap in vote choice and partisan identification. This was said due to be to men's shift in political preference from the Democrat to the Republican Party combined with men's increased identification as politically independent, although in elections these independent leading men tend to vote Republican. Whilst women were likely to identify as less likely to identify as independent, instead maintaining even weak democratic identification. Although the review below focuses upon women as the key reason for that emergence of a partisan gender gap in the United States, these studies demonstrate the interaction of the political behaviors of both sexes contributed to its emergence. Women's growing autonomy. The explanations of the gender gap, which are grouped under the title Women's Growing Autonomy, examine the interaction of socioeconomic status and sex as variables. In certain situations, it is posited that differences in men and women's political attitudes come from working women's disadvantaged socioeconomic status. Blindberg and Siegel neatly summarized this perspective when they wrote, Women's political behavior can best be understood if we think of women as a disadvantaged or vulnerable minority a group disaffected by its status of dependence. It is hypothesized that women's recognition of their vulnerability led or leads them to support left-wing parties supportive of funding governmental safety net programs. Analyses of these gender gaps, as explained by economic status, observe that women earn less than men and that women constitute a disproportionate number of recipients of social, refer uh, social welfare. These facts were used by Erie and Rain, who hypothesized that women's liberal attitudes toward social welfare was a result of women's rational self-interest. This self-interest, according to Erie and Rain, translated it politically into votes for Democratic candidates. 
They suggested that because women are more dependent upon the welfare state, they support the party that con supports continuing those welfare programs upon which they rely. The notion of women as economically vulnerable, coupled with women's dependence upon the welfare state, continues to play a role in, ex in explanations of the gender gap. Anderson, for example, elaborated another form of this theory through an analysis which links American women's vote choice to their propensity to be employed in public sector jobs, teaching and social services, for example, or, to close, or closely associated with the government, such as the American health care system. Such gender gap theories assume some or all of the following. One, women earn low wages relative to men and their political choices are driven by their sense of economic vulnerability. Two, this sense of economic vulnerability results in women prioritizing social safety net programs due to self-interest. Three, numerically more women than men rely upon government-sponsored welfare services. And four, women are more likely to be employed by or dependent upon governmental bodies or agencies, and they therefore support the party which promises, a continued, which promises continued government funding for their public service jobs or benefits. However, the rational choice theory of the gender gap, which states women vote to maximize their own economic interest in maintaining welfare programs or employment within government, has not had much empirical support when tested competitively with other gender gap theoretical accounts. Contrast, contrary to such theories, several studies have found that the gender variable remains statistically significant, a statistically significant variable after controlling for the theorized causes of women's economic vulnerability, such as income, education, occupation, race, and age. As Howell and Day note, class stratification does not tell the whole story of the gender gap, end quote. I didn't put the end quote in the other ones. I'm going to start doing end quotes when, I'm, when appropriate, so apologies. Returning to the chapter. Alternatively, working women's improved ability to live economically independent from men has also been hypothesized as a source for the gender gap. Lipset theorized that work exposes voters to discussions of policy and candidates. Others have linked the disappearance of a voting turnout gap between men and women to women's increasing participation in education and the workforce. This version of the women's growing autonomy theory speculates that women who work are exposed to situations that call into question traditional gender norms. Carroll found that women who were the most economically independent from men, specifically those women who possessed higher levels of education, were those, uh, those who were unmarried, both single and divorced, and those with higher occupational status, were the most different from men in their voting behavior and opinion of presidential approval. She writes, the gender gap may best be understood as a manifestation of individual women's increased political autonomy from men." End quote. Manza and Brooks studied survey data from 11 elections since 1952 and concluded that women's changing labor part force participation explained the origins of the gender gap. Rosenthal concluded that it was women's economic and psychological independence from men that in part explained the gender gap in vote choice that emerged in the United States in the 1980s while noting that this effect may be mediated by other demographic variables such as income. Eland and Pandey looked at a specific segment of women, of American women, middle class women. They found that employment is related to the likelihood of middle class women's support for the Democrats, but not to that of poor or rich women. In conclusion, there is not a clear story as to how women's increased autonomy relates to the development of a sex gap in women's political preferences. And more crucially, these theories constructed to problematizing women's political behavior offer no insight into men's political attitudes or behaviors. Feminist consciousness. Attitudes toward men and women's roles have been categorized into three gender ideologies. A traditional gender ideology is one that holds that a man's sphere is work and a woman's sphere is home, with the underlying assumption that men have a greater power than women. An egalitarian gender ideology is the view that power is distributed equally between men and women, and both identify equally with the home and work spheres. Hawke's child also identified a third gender ideology transitional ideology, which views it as acceptable for women to devote energy to both work and family, but should hold more responsibility for the home, while men should focus more on their work. Inglehart and Norris developed a gender equality scale, which, when measured across time, 
shows increasing attitudes of gender equality, most notably in post-industrial nations. These findings are mirrored in the work of Twenge, who found that attitudes toward men and women's work became more liberal from 1970 to 1995. In Twenge's study, both men and women's attitudes became more liberal during the late 1970s, an important time in second wave feminist activities. Studies indicate that men and women are increasingly embracing more egalitarian views of how men and women can and should behave, yet women still scored higher on care measures than men, while men scored higher on measures of justice. And again, consistent with accepted gender roles, men score higher on questions associated with being assertive, while men, women score higher on measures of being nurturing. Feminist consciousness is the category for theories that link gender gaps in political behavior with support for women's rights, egalitarian views toward gender roles, or link women's attitudes and behaviors to their experiences as women. According to one aspect of this theory, it was women's increased awareness of discrimination and inequality in society, and women's subsequent activism to remedy these problems, which is at the root of the political gender gap. Early gender gap analysis by Frankovic drew upon the theory that feminist views, especially women's disapproval of the way Reagan handled political issues, particularly his hawkish foreign policy, was behind the gender gap. After controlling for age and education, which did not reduce the size of the difference between the sexes, Frankovic attempted to use feminist measures to account for the difference. Controlling for the respondent's position on so-called women's issues, such as the failed Equal Rights Amendment or support for legalized abortion, these variables could not account for the difference in partisan preferences. Later studies also concluded that using variables which captured, captured a respondent's position on women's issues did not explain the gender gap because, by and large, men and women's views on these issues were not starkly different. Attitudinal differences between men and women, which could account for the gap, were lacking. Although the impact of second-wave feminism most likely plays some role in the emergence of the gender gap, this impact seems to be achieved indirectly through the changing attitudes of men, of women and men as to what are considered appropriate gender roles for the sexes. Pause for a water break. As noted above, the feminist consciousness explanation can also relate to distinctly female experiences or attitudes, such as motherhood. Feminist writers have explored the possibility that parenthood and the traditional sexual division of labor could be sources of the gender gap in political attitudes and behaviors. They suggest that there is an effect on women's political views due to women's sex and gender role as primary caregivers of children. Motherhood is seen as having an important influence on how women view politics because it constitutes a large amount of their labor. It is hypothesized that women's greater propensity to provide primary care for their children and be present in the home while men participate in the public sphere causes women to value caring for others and to feel a sense of connection with others. Drawing upon, upon Freudian theory, Diamond Hartsock claimed that psychoanalytic evidence suggests women define themselves in relation to others, while men form a separate sense of, a sense of self that is separate. Chodra asserts that as women are more likely to be present in the home caring for children, while men are absent and active in the public sphere, women's experiences lead them to prioritize relationships and view themselves as connected to others. Conversely, men are said to be more likely to think of themselves as autonomous individuals. Chodra speculates that such differences will remain until men and women undertake dual parenting. In a similar vein, Ruddick claims that the daily experiences of mothering encourages a caring and altruistic perspective from which women think about society and politics. Men, on the other hand, do not have a care for others as the center of their daily experience and therefore do not develop the same compassionate nature. However, Oswald demonstrated with longitudinal British data that having daughters makes people far more likely to vote for left-wing parties. Having sons leads people to vote favor right-wing parties. Warner and Warner and Steele found changes in attitude on gender equality are more pronounced for fathers who have daughters, and they speculate that the experience of raising a girl may undermine her father's patriarchal attitudes. Given the contradictions between feminist theory and the initial empirical evidence, there is need for more investigation into the effects of one, having children, and two, the sex of the child on the parent's political attitudes. 
attempts to test feminist consciousness as a causal mechanism for the sex gap in American political preferences have been inconclusive at best. Howell and Day write, quote, It is difficult to argue that feminism explains political and issue differences because the causal direction between the two is not yet clear, unquote. Feminist measures have rarely produced any statistically significant coefficients in American gender gap analysis. However, this may be the result of parallel shifts in attitudes toward men and women's roles in societies in general, or perhaps due to improper am operationalization of the measures which need to be tested, for instance, men's theorized feelings of being separate and women's feelings of being connected. Evidence for the idea of parallel shifts in feminist attitudes can be found in the work of Bernadette Hayes, who analyzed 1992 British election study data and found that feminist attitudes predicted the Labour Party votes of men and women equally well, and that individuals with pro-feminist orientations were significantly less likely to vote for the Conservative Party than any other party. She concluded that, in the British context, an individual's feminist orientation, and not his or her gender, by which she means biological sex, was the important variable. Childhood and Adulthood Socialization and Gender Socialization accounts of the gender gap in political attitudes and behavior cover all social influences and types of socialization. Childhood socialization, adult socialization, and life experiences can all be considered as part of the socialization hypothesis. The different moral framework of boys and girls, as outlined initially by Kohlberg and later re-examined by Gilligan, form part of the childhood socialization theory. American political science has incorporated Gilligan's work on different moral frameworks by, sim simplifying, her finds, sim by simplifying her findings into a simplistic dichotomous variable, which predicts women's moral frameworks will be based upon compassion and ethics of care, whereas men's will be based in notions of right and wrong and ethics of justice. These childhood socialization accounts hold that gender differences stem from sex role conditioning experienced by boys and girls, and that the influence of these differences are assumed to carry through to adulthood. Can political preferences be set as early as childhood? Recent research suggests it can. Friedrich and Kenny Kennedy studied 8th grade American middle students, 13 to 14 year olds, and found that a gender gap in policy and partisanship is established early, before children reach adulthood. Based upon their results, they suggest that the adult American gender gap is rooted, at least partially, in childhood socialization. Adulthood socialization theories hypothesize that gender differences are produced slash caused by the roles which ad adults adapt and this adopt, and this is especially the case with the impact of motherhood upon women. Adult socialization, adulthood socialization theory predicts that women who have been socialized to value nurturing activities may react favorably toward parties offering social welfare policies. Both childhood and adulthood socialization theories view differences in political preferences as coming from sex role differentiation patterns which are built up over the course of one's life and life experiences. Social learning theory and gender role socialization. Social learning theory attempts to account for how behavior is learned. According to the theory, it is learned in two ways. One, through others' modeling, modeled behavior, and two, through social reinforcement. Gender roles and gendered behavior are explained as being socially constructed and altered by exposure to new and different modeled behaviors. Central to social learning theory is the idea that the individual, usually a child, is a passive agent upon whom society is impacting. According to the theory, cultural forces and the influence of others determine appropriate gender behavior. The, child res the individual responds to rewards and punishments in the environment. Observing and performing gender-appropriate behavior leads to developing one's gender identity. The gender identity does not lead to the behavior. Social learning theory, theory can account for how and why sex differences in cognition have changed in a brief period of time, and in particular can explain how can explain changes that are too fast to be explained by biology or evolutionary changes in cognition. According to the social learning theory, sex differences are altered as social norms and cultural role models change. The emergence of alternative models of appropriate gender behavior influences how males and females perceive the ideal man and ideal woman.
Consider the strong and silent ideal projected by John Wayne in the 1950s as compared with the 1990s macho Bob Ma Moss, bah, the 1990s macho mob boss Tony Soprano, who went into therapy to discuss the emotional basis for the character's panic attacks. How, is a man, how a man is expected to behave in the early part of the 21st century is quite different from the ideal of male behavior in the 1950s. The change has been even greater for women's social norms in both the public and private spheres. Social learning theory can be used to account for the changes to girls and women's economic and occupational aspirations, which underpin the women's autonomy theory outlined above. Girls' preferences for stereotypical female occupations have decreased over time, while their preference for traditionally male-dominated occupations have increased. Consequently, there are increasing numbers of women who have entered the workforce to occupy professions previously dominated by men. Similar to Chaudhry's idea on the role of dual parenting, Halpern speculates that as societies shift toward more as societies shift more toward accepting and encouraging men's roles as active and nurturing fathers, the sex gap in empathy and nurturance may be reduced. As women become more involved in activities that require spatial analysis, such as sports, sex differences and spatial abilities may be reduced. Gender role socialization builds upon the principles of general social learning theory to account for how individuals take on gendered roles. It posits that cultural cues in the environment encourage men to be agentic and women to be communal, and in so doing, to take on the modeled male and female gender roles. Boys are taught to control their expressions of feeling and be, absurd, be assertive, behaviors associated with agency. Girls are encouraged to express concern for others and to be more passive, behaviors associated with communion. This is encouraged either indirectly through observing the modeling of others' behavior or directly through rewards and punishments. For instance, a parent scolding a son who cries or dissuading a daughter from acting like a tomboy. Gendered roles are reinforced through life as individuals move from childhood to adulthood, marry, and become parents. In summary, social learning theory, and more specifically, gender role socialization theory, attempt to account for changes in both sex-based differences in cognition, as well as shifting cultural norms through the influence of modeling and reinforcing gender role appropriate behavior. Social learning theories have the advantage of being able to account for declines in those sex differences of cognitive performance that have diminished as societies embrace gender equality, and men and women's experience inside and outside the home become similar. A criticism of the theory is that it views people as passive agents who are influenced by society's values and modeled, modeled ideas, not as active agents which create social norms. Social role theory. According to social role theory, it is the differences in men and women's social roles that create gendered behavior. This theory focuses on the social conditions of a society instead of the passive reactions assumed in the social learning theory. In this paradigm, the way in which labor is divided between men and women in society explains why men become agentic and women become communal. It is because men are primarily responsible for work outside the home that they adopt an agentic framework. Women's responsibility for work inside the home, even when employed, leads them to adopt a communal orientation. When women do work outside the home, their employment patterns are different from those of men. Jobs that require competitiveness and benefit from some amount of aggression, such as business or law, are male-dominated, while service industries, which require the ability to nurture, such as nursing or teaching, are dominated by women. Social role theory does not require that men adopt agentic, an agentic outlook or women a communal one. Rather, it theorizes that it is because societies have differentiated men and women's social roles perhaps as path-dependent extensions of evolutionary roles, that gender differences exist. Wood and Eagley have advanced a modification of social role theory that takes into account the function of physiological differences between men and women, as well as the social roles they occupy. Tying it all together. At this point, it might be useful to pull together what may seem to be several disparate threads and connect the topic of this thesis to American gender gap theories presented above. From the American gender gap literature, I have linked and extracted two repeating concepts Im implicitly contained within the, the theories, but never clearly conceptually articulated, agency and communion. 
These themes will form the conceptual basis for this investigation. As the word agency in particular has been used in different contexts to mean different things, it is necessary to clarify what the terms agency and communion will mean in the context of this thesis. David Bakken developed the idea of agency and communion in his book, The, Dual, uh, the Duality of Human Existence, Isolation and Communion in Western Man, wherein he argued there are two principles of human existence, an agentic one where the focus is upon the self and separation, and a communal one where the focus is upon others and connection. Agency involves self-enhancement and self-assertion, whereas communion entails group participation and cooperation with others. An agentic person exists for him or herself and forms separations. The communal person provides for the group and embeds the self in a collective. Marshall defines the concept as follows, quote, agency is an expression of independence through self-protection, self-assertion, and control of the environment. Communion is the sense of being at one with other organisms or the context. Its basis is integration, interdependence, receptivity, unquote. Marshall organized the characteristics of agency and communion into categories below in Table 1.1. Bakken also suggested that agency was a masculine trait and communion was a feminine one. This assertion was later somewhat supported by empirical evidence showing that while men and women both possess agency and communion, a higher sense of agency is more common in men and a higher sense of communion is more common in women. However, it is still possible for an individual woman to have a high sense of agency and for a man to have a high sense of communion with others. Carlson classified self-reported instances of affect as agentic, communal, or mixed. Affective instances reported by men were significantly more agentic than were those reported by women, supporting the notion of sex differences in modes of self-expression. And for those of you who are listening, if you want to see what Table 1.1 characteristics of agency and communion views were produced from Marshall look like, it is on the screen right now. The three categories of American gender gap, I'm sorry, the three categories of American theories of the gender gap outlined earlier were, one, those theories concerned with women's growing legal and economic autonomy, the concomitant rising in women's dependency on the welfare state, and women's increased participation in government funded public sector, in the government funded public sector. Two, those that explore the role of feminism, specifically second wave fem feminism, in increasing women's feminist consciousness. And three, those that incorporate the effects of gendered socialization of men and women. Each theory can be directly related to the ideas of agency and communion. I would argue that women's sense of agency is the basis of those theories of women's legal and economic independence. If a woman is economically dependent and reliant upon public services, what I would term a low sense of agency, the gender gap theory hypothesis hypothesizes she will support public programs that are designed to help people, a communal outlook. Another interpretation of women's autonomy theory predicts that women who have gained legal and economic independence and act differently from men have um, have done so as a result of their perception of their own agency. In feminist theory, women's characteristic connectedness, whether it be sourced to Freudian ideas of women not separating from their mothers or to women's experience as mothers, is grounded in what I see as an assumption that women possess or further develop a communal view of interpersonal relationships. Likewise, Diamond and Hartsock's Freudian theory of separation experienced by men can, within the paradigm I am proposing, be viewed as positing that men are generally assumed to have a more agentic, autonomous perspective on interpersonal relationships. Finally, the social con socially constructed gender roles of socialization theory can be interpreted through the concepts of agency and communion that I propose. The traditional teaching of a masculine role to males can be termed as conditioning agency, whilst the traditional teaching of feminine roles to females can be viewed as conditioning communion. In the following chapters, these concepts of agency and communion will be quantified using well-established psychological measures of masculinity and femininity. These measures were included in an internet survey which attempted to specifically relate the separate explanatory contributions of sex and gender to men and women's political preferences and behavior. To set the stage for the rest of this thesis, the focus of this chapter now shifts to Britain and the analysis of gendered political preferences and behaviors in the British context. And that seems like a good place to end this
segment. Let me do an alt tab and see. Ooh, I went a little bit long, but it was, I think, important to do all of those theories contiguously so that you can keep all of them in mind because, as I point out near the end of this section, um, all of these things, whether it's about women's economic stuff or feminist consciousness or socialization theory, have at their core what I see to be these themes of agency and communion. And so um, I wanted to go through all of them, one, because I had to, because that's what you do in a doctoral thesis. You do a literature review, you demonstrate that you know what you're talking about, you've read around, you've looked at the studies, and you understand what has already been done before you started. But then also to look at it from a more meta level and say, look, you know, you guys are all talking about these things as if they're different, but there is something here that connects all of them. And I'm going to be pointing to that connecting thread as being agency and communion. So in the next session, section, we're going to get onto the British gender gap and issue preferences. And also one of the things that I will be bringing up, I think, in this chapter is the fact that none of these theories uh, problematize men and men's behavior and that the one of the critiques that I provide later on is that gender gap theory tends to try to explain women's behavior and doesn't really try to explain men's. But um, I'm going to get onto that after I reviewed all the theories and then after, and I'll say what I see is deficient in them. So for all of you geeks who are still listening, thanks all the way for listening all the way to the end. Thank you for your patience with my stumbling and occasionally reading words wrong with my water breaks and everything else. I do appreciate it and I will talk to you in the next section. Uh, you're awesome. Bye.